There are many dangers in the undersea world. Creatures that can bite or sting the underwater explorer. The real danger, though, is not the animals, but the gas you're breathing right now, nitrogen. I'm basically drunk, intoxicated, and it's affecting my brain functions. I'm heading deep into the ocean by scuba and in a submersible to explore what happens to me under pressure. The ocean is by far the most challenging place on our planet to explore. It can be cold and dark, and sometimes full of strange and often dangerous creatures. But the biggest obstacle to deep sea exploration is a simple principle, but incredibly difficult to overcome. Pressure. The deeper you go, the greater it gets. No human has ever survived unprotected beyond about 330 meters, which means over 60% of the Earth is inaccessible to scuba divers. So ocean explorers use special suits and submersible vehicles to probe the depths of the undersea world. I want to go deep into this underwater world, which, as usual, requires some traveling. Well, I've arrived in the Cayman Islands. This place is known for two things, banking and the pristine waters they have here. It starts off shallow, but it drops off to up to 25,000 feet just offshore. I've been a diver for over 20 years, and I've had some incredible underwater experiences thanks to the scuba breathing system. It has allowed me to explore the marine world with tremendous freedom. And my diving here in the Caymans will be no exception. But breathing compressed gas under water pressure has many drawbacks and some serious dangers. The air we breathe at the surface contains harmless nitrogen. The deeper you dive, the more nitrogen is absorbed by your bloodstream and can cause nitrogen narcosis, which is similar to being intoxicated. Not something you want to be while making life or death decisions 100 feet down. So divers have to be keenly aware of their depth and mental alertness. The bigger problem with breathing compressed air at depth is you have to get rid of the nitrogen in your bloodstream before you surface, or risk embolism or decompression sickness, known as the bends. Getting the bends can be unpleasant at best and fatal at worst. But there are other ways to explore this magnificent world. You know, you don't have to be a research scientist or work in the offshore oil industry or even be a multi-millionaire these days to get a feel of what it's like to ride in a real submarine like this one. Now, this old girl's been out of service for quite some time, but here in the Cayman Islands, I found a place where you can get a ride in the real deal. Atlantis Submarines has a fleet of vessels exploring the waters of the Caribbean and Hawaii. This is no toy by any means. This sub is a multi-million dollar machine and it operates exactly under the same principles as any research or military submarine out there. This 65-foot submarine has been tested at depths of over 200 feet and can be maneuvered within inches of Grand Cayman's famous underwater wall.
state-of-the-art systems control scores of functions aboard the ship. Including ballast, thrusters, navigation, and air quality. And this submarine maintains one atmosphere's worth of pressure, so it's the same as being on the surface at sea level. Basically what's happening is the hull of the submarine is very rigid and it's absorbing all that water pressure that's pushing down on the sub right now. So my ears are not popping whatsoever. There's no difference in the air pressure inside the sub. The sub also protects me from the effects of breathing pressurized air that can occur while scuba diving. That means I could spend as much time as I wanted down here without ever having to decompress. Assuming I could come up with the one and a half million dollars I'd need to buy one. At the big school of horse head jacks to see if we can the travel the jacks. But even during this two hour yeah, right voyage, I managed to see a huge variety of undersea life. Feet. All right, shall we take her back up? Sounds good to me. My trip to the Caymans was a great underwater experience. But I'm pretty sure I can handle more pressure than this. I'm experiencing the pressures of going underwater. After exploring the reefs of the Cayman Islands by scuba diving and in a submarine, I'm ready to find out just how much pressure I can take. So I've come to Defense Canada's research facility to undergo deep dive training. Hey, this place is very cool. So this is the chamber. It is, George, yes. This is uh, the main uh, research facility we have here at the Experimental Diving and Undersea Group. We can simulate depths up to 1,700 meters, and that's well beyond the uh, capabilities of manned uh, diving. Right, so 1,700 meters unmanned, and how deep do you take it with people inside? Our actual operational diving range is down to 100 meters seawater, uh, so we've done uh, diving in this up to that depth. Right, uh, that's pretty extreme. Equipment. It is, yeah, yeah, it's fairly extreme. When I go inside, I'll be going down to about 45 meters, but the chamber is capable of doing much, much deeper, and we're gonna do a test down to 750. And to show you exactly what happens, we've got some styrofoam cups in here, we've got a large ball, I'm going to inflate some balloons, and you're going to see them get crushed by the incredible air pressure. To give a bit of a demonstration as to the power of this machine and the power of pressure underwater, we're dropping the atmosphere inside the transfer chamber to 750 meters below surface. I'll check in on the experiment later. Meanwhile, I have to undergo a battery of medical tests to ensure that my body can withstand the extreme pressures I'll be subjected to. All right, now they're not gonna let me into the chamber in my civilian clothes, so what they've given me is this. And I know what you're thinking, it belongs on a Paris runway. <laughs> but they don't want sparks, they don't want anything that is flammable, so I've gotta put on their fire-resistant suit. Now I'm ready. Okay, this is now finished at 750 meter descent. Oh, it's freezing in here. On the way down, the temperature went up to 60 Celsius and it dropped to minus 10 on the way back up. Check this out. Here's probably the most dramatic example of what pressure can do. This is a coffee cup that just came up from 750 meters and this is what it started off as. Imagine what this pressure could do to your body. Now it's time to put me in here. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to be uh, supervising this dive today. We're going to do a uh, 45 for 20 minute schedule. You're wearing jurettes, anti-static clothing. You have uh, chamber shoes on. Watch Joe. He's going to be your inside tender. No movement on the way down. Thumbs up. Any problems whatsoever with your ears, clench your fist and yell stop to Joe. He'll pass that on to me. Equipment's good to go. Chamber's flashed and ready to go. 
Let's do it. All right. This research facility is used extensively by the Canadian military to study the effects of atmospheric pressure on the human body. Experiments performed here played a key role in developing decompression tables used by divers around the world. The team monitors every aspect of the dive carefully. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Looking for any signs of distress from the divers, which could be very dangerous at these pressures. All right, here we go. So we are at the bottom right now, and you're probably already laughing at me because you're hearing the pitch of my voice. It's kind of like being on helium down here, but it's just regular air. The air is so dense, and the effects of the pressure on my vocal cords combined to create a really high-pitched sound. I know it sounds really, really silly. The depth we're at right now is 146, 147 feet, which is equivalent to 45 meters. This is a fully inflated balloon at depth. This is one that was inflated at the surface, so it has shrunk by an incredible amount, as you can tell. This one will expand back to its regular size. This one will expand now until it explodes. I tell you, of all the things I get to do, this is certainly one of the more surreal, because I'm basically drunk, intoxicated, by breathing in compressed air, and this nitrogen has, has, has gone into my system, and it's affecting my brain functions. The more time that we spend at this depth, the more nitrogen is being absorbed by our body. So we're sort of running out of time. We're gonna have to start going up and getting some of this pressure off of us, or else we'll be here decompressing forever. All divers okay? 15 seconds, thumbs up. Thumbs up, 15 seconds. Okay, here we go. We're going back up. Traveling. Traveling. This is why a scuba diver would never hold their breath during an ascent. All divers okay? All okay. divers okay. Okay, Joe, plug all bibs into O2. Plugging all bibs into O2. All bibs are on O2. As we ascend, we have to stop halfway and breathe pure oxygen in order to gas off the remaining nitrogen in our systems. Then, we make a safe return to the surface. Research facilities like this are vital for developing techniques to dive deeper and safer. All right, time for my post-dive gas bubble check. Now, the medical team checks to see how much nitrogen is left over in my bloodstream. Wow. So measuring the Doppler over here at my shoulder can definitely pick up some nitrogen bubbles in my blood. And actually being able to hear the nitrogen bubbles in my body is somewhat unnerving. The trick is to not develop any symptoms over the next 24 hours. So I'm actually gonna be on decompression watch, Ben's watch they call it. So if there's any kind of medical things that come up, if I start getting pain in my joints or my shoulders, then I can call and then they'll probably throw me back in the chamber, I would imagine. Yeah. I'm exploring the incredible world deep underwater. Mankind has long been on a quest to go ever deeper into the world's oceans. Submersible technology has taken us to depths never before thought possible. Roger, Max, we are on bottom at one, six, four, five meters, over. Witnessing natural wonders never before seen by human eyes. Like these underwater volcanoes found in the Pacific Ocean that stunned scientists. I've come to British Columbia to see this remarkable technology for myself. In this cramped warehouse in North Vancouver, 
is the workshop of one of the world's leading experts on subsea exploration vehicles. Phil Newton is an artist, writer, explorer, and submarine maker. This inventor... Start with deep rover. This sub dives to uh, well over 3,000 feet, about 1,000 meters. All the subs that we build at Nutco uh, are all designed for well over 100% safety factor. So, for instance, the uh, the dual deep worker and the deep workers uh, are designed for 2,000 feet, but their guaranteed collapse is 4,000 feet. But we even add some, you know, conservation on that. So they're probably good for five or 6,000 feet. Right. You know, so there's a huge safety factor. Now, Phil does not just build submarines. He builds suits that are basically a submarine that you wear. This is the latest and greatest, newest generation called the exosuit. That's right. Well, the, the predecessor to this one is called the newt suit, which is a takeoff of my last name and, of course, the aquatic salamander. Which is in service right now. Oh, yeah. It's all used by all over the world by navies and by submarine rescue teams. and. The concept behind the exosuit is that these special joints allow you to actually swim in the suit at great depths, making underwater work much easier. So this is just the, uh, an ergonomic uh, mock-up, a prototype, but boy, oh boy, the, the real one's going to be really something. The idea of someday exploring the bottom of the ocean in a machine like this is tremendously exciting to me. More people have been to the moon than some of the places Phil has gone. When you're sitting down at 1,500 to 2,000 feet on this thing and you, and you watch everything in the water column and you look at the reef around you and you realize that you're the only human being on the planet that's ever seen what you're seeing. I'm in the workshop of submarine builder Phil Newton, who manufactures the most incredible underwater vehicles I've ever seen. It looks like a UFO. It drives like a sports car, but it's good for 2,000 feet down. Just imagine being 2,000 feet under the sea, just swimming around like a fish in this thing. Amazing. So that is pretty, uh, it's pretty cool. Isn't that something? I want one. Submersible technology like this has allowed increasingly deeper explorations of the marine world and has enabled scientists to make one of the most surprising discoveries in the history of oceanography, underwater hydrothermal vents. Phil remembers when his colleagues made the stunning find back in 1977. The discovery of the heat vent is certainly well known to me. A couple of friends of mine were on board the vessel and the submarine that found the very first heat vent off the Galapagos, and uh, they were, <laughs> to say blown away is a complete understatement. The scientists found not only these mineral-rich chimneys venting the Earth's volcanic power, but more amazingly, colonies of life, never before thought possible in such an extreme and hostile environment. Life without sun. Uh, here we have life that is not based on sunlight. It's based not on photosynthesis, but on chemosynthesis, taking the, the uh, energy and the fuel directly from the heat vent. This remarkable discovery turned the science of marine biology upside down. 
the incredibly exciting thing about this environment these animals are found in the black smoker environment is how phenomenally hostile this environment is it is a place that is hot and cold hot like seven or eight hundred degrees cold like close to freezing a few centimeters away it's an environment that's toxic hydrogen sulfide is coming out under extreme pressure and this is a gas that will kill you dead if you breathe it now what's intriguing is until this ecosystem was discovered only 30 years ago, uh, really this wasn't, a, you know, there was no understanding that animals could possibly live under such hostile conditions. Chris Harvey Clark has spent his life studying the fascinating and often strange creatures that inhabit the Earth's oceans. Professor at the University of British Columbia, Chris has logged many hours diving in the waters of the Pacific Northwest. And I'm accompanying him to explore the marine life in this region. I'm back in my familiar scuba gear and ready to dive in the chilly coastal water that sits on the Juan de Fuca plate, part of the Pacific Ring of Fire that is home to the black smokers. What's truly amazing is that one ocean can sustain two vastly different ecosystems. Here in the shallow water, uh, we have this amazing diversity of life, and it's all because of light. Light, photosynthesis, and the explosion in phytoplankton and zooplankton, all related to the fact that the processes are light-driven and light is energy. Well, in the deep sea vents, Hydrogen sulfide is energy. And so we have a sort of upside down ecosystem. Up here we've got sun coming down. Down there we've got hydrogen sulfide and other energy rich compounds coming up out of the, the magma, really the mantle of the earth. No matter if it's in the sunny Caribbean or the waters off Vancouver Island, as long as I can find a way Because this planet is ocean, and we're the first generation, really, to see our planet from space and to realize it should have been called ocean, not Earth.